Good morning, I'm Emily with NC Tech. Thanks so much for uh, registering to attend this morning's workshop hosted by and sponsored by RTI Innovation Advisors. This is a program that our members are able to do to bring you an awesome interactive virtual workshop on lots of different topics. So we're really excited to have Jim here today. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. If you could uh, submit any questions you might have for him during the presentation through the Q&A and he can look through those or answer them at the end, he'll let you know how he's going to go ahead and handle those. Um, you are in listen-only mode, so if you have any technology issues or any questions for me, you can reach me through the chat. And um, we will be sharing the presentation link recording with you after and uh, giving you some information on how to get in touch with Jim uh, with any other additional questions or comments. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jim Redden with RTI Innovation Advisors. All right, thank you very much. Welcome everybody. And, and thank you to NC Tech for hosting this event and allowing us to kind of come gather this, this group. One of the things, before we get started, one of the things that I've been hearing from folks, you know, the, in my network and, and innovation circles that I've been talking with is about the challenge of networking in the COVID, in the, the virtual era. And from what I understand, these workshop formats used to be in person, people could kind of meet and discuss. That's a little different now. It's a, it's a webinar presentation. You're on the other end of the line listening. Uh, a little bit harder to get that connection, that benefit from, from this event. So I wanna encourage you, if you're interested, networking takes a new level of intentionality here in the COVID area, era. If you're interested in potentially connecting, not just with me, but with other people who have attended this webinar, go ahead and drop your, your name, your title, you know, something about what your interests are into the chat. Uh, and maybe other folks who are on this webinar will see and be willing to reach out and make some of those connections. I think we just have to all work harder to build those professional networks uh, in the virtual era. So today we're gonna be talking about bringing the future into focus using strategic foresight. Uh, I'm Jim Redden, the strategic foresight lead with the Innova RTI Innovation Advisors. And before we get started, before I launch into kind of the content for today, I wanted to take a minute to just add a little context about who we are and what we do, both in the RTI Innovation Advisors and RTI as an institute more broadly, for those who are unfamiliar. So to start, uh, we are a mission-driven innovation consultancy. RTI Innovation Advisors. We believe in the power of innovation to drive transformational change in the world. And all you have to do is look at the, the massive changes that have occurred in the last six months to realize that we need positive change across society now more than ever. So I'm really proud to be working for an organization that is a nonprofit, it is mission-driven and believes in the power of technology and innovation to create that, that change. The RTI Innovation Advisors are uh, a part of the broader RTI International Institute, headquartered right there in RTP. And like the Innovation Advisors, RTI International is a mission-driven research organization that really believes in the power of, of science to improve the human condition. And RTI's mission is to turn knowledge into practice to improve, improve the world. So a little bit more about kind of what we do, how we bring that mission to fulfillment in the innovation advisors. We have three large uh, kind of areas that we work in supporting innovation teams and supporting that transformational change. In the top right there, which is kind of our focus here for today, we help organizations and teams discern complex futures. We help clients kind of learn about what's going on, the trends and drivers, the forces shaping the world around us, uh, and how to best position their organizations to, to both drive transformational change and also create impact for consumers uh, and their shareholders. We also support R&D and innovation groups through our insights, our innovation insights practice. There we do things like technology landscaping, partner scouting, et cetera. And then last but not least, it's probably our, our, our longest running type of service offering. Uh, we've been around for 50 years supporting uh, technology commercialization and go-to-market efforts. We began uh, supporting NASA way back in the 1960s in their technology commercialization efforts, and we continue to work with them to this day. So that's a little bit about the, the RTI Innovation Advisors. What are we gonna do here today over the course of the next hour? 
Well, first, we're going to look at the challenges that are facing organizations, in, particularly, in particular, some of the challenges that have uh, arisen as a result of the pandemic. Next, we're going to talk about strategic foresight as a tool for helping wrestle with the complexity that has been brought about by these changes. We'll sh I'll share with you RTI, Innovation Advisors Foresight Process, including some, some tips and tricks for each stage of that process so that you can take some of that back and, and hopefully apply some of those principles in your organization. And then last but not least, I'll walk through a, a, a short case study where I, I'm really looking forward to sharing some of the insights of my own observations about what's going on in the world and what it might mean for the future. As mentioned, if you have questions along the way, I'm gonna save a chunk of time at the end to address those questions. Drop them into the, the Q&A box uh, and I'll, I'll keep tabs on those and, and address them as they come. All right, so, so it's no secret that the global pandemic has really upended a lot of the way the, the world works at this point. It's resulted in kind of a step change uh, across a lot of industries and accelerated a lot of existing trends or decelerated others and, and kind of toppled certain industries and, and really caused a lot of anxiety and questions about what's gonna happen next. So amidst this backdrop of massive change across all kinds of sectors and all kinds of categories, it can be helpful to have a framework for understanding that change, understanding how to kind of categorize that change. So I'll present a framework here. It's, it's certainly not the only one, uh, but it's the one that I think will be helpful for us here uh, in this webinar and in this call. Okay, so first, we can look at the change that's happening across organizational supply chains. Everybody's seen you know, empty shelves at the grocery stores and the impact that some of the global supply chain disruptions have had uh, on people's lives. We can also look at internal operations of organizations and think about all of the changes that have occurred as people shift to working from home, as internal operations try to figure out how to conduct lab experiments uh, safely, maintaining the, the health and safety of their workforce. And then last, we can also think about uh, consumers or our end users, the, those folks that our organizations serve and think about the changes that they're undergoing in their daily lives, how that changes their, their buying patterns, their behaviors, et cetera. All three of these categories of change that are really kind of core to organizational operations exist within the backdrop of broader, larger societal trends and changes that are happening. Uh, we like to use this steep framework to think about those trends. You know, you can think about social social changes happening as a result of whether it's protests or, or other types of social changes. There's certainly technological advances and things that are being accelerated. And even uh, things like climate change, even in the COVID era, it still exists. So all of these recent changes exist against the backdrop of broader, larger societal changes. So to add a little bit more context and color to the comments that I'm gonna make through the rest of this webinar, I wanted to first pause and ask a question through the poll window here to get to know kind of the folks on the line a little bit better and what it is that you're struggling with. So the, you should have just seen a, a, a poll question launched through the Zoom platform. Which challenges are a priority for you and your teams over the next three months? Now I've pre-populated with a few options. Uh, if none of those options are the challenges that you're facing, that's great too. Drop uh, your answer into the chat window. Uh, I'm, I'm really curious and I'd love to see. So I'll give folks about 30 seconds to read the options and make a selection.
Okay, so I think we're having some potentially technical difficulties sharing the results, but we'll we'll come back to, to those a little bit later. Oh, here, here they are. All right, great. So it seems uh, the top choice was developing new and nimble business models. Uh, after a quick scan coming in second, finding new and better ways to connect. Okay, excellent. I'll keep that in mind, especially that business model context as we're as we're looking through uh, the rest of the content here today. So we had to select a, a focus area here for uh, how to talk about strategic foresight and the impacts that it can have inside organizations. And, and for today, I've chosen to focus on how to use strategic foresight to better understand future consumer behavior. Uh, you could just as easily have applied and, and spent some time thinking about future supply chain challenges. Uh, you can think about applying strategic foresight to the future of work and what that looks like for organizations. But there's just been so much change happening in consumers' lives and, and it's a particularly challenging thing to, to, to wrestle with what that new normal looks like for consumers that I thought it would be an interesting place to start. So let's look, what, what are some of the changes uh, that have been impacting consumers recently? What does that look like? Well, certainly there's been new buying patterns that have emerged as a result of the pandemic. The quarantine and lockdown has fundamentally altered the way people live, work, interact with, with products and services. You know, as, as children were pulled out of schools, many folks became homeschooling parents for the first time, which resulted in all kinds of new challenges. And who knows what that future is gonna look like as we move forward. It hasn't all been challenges. There have absolutely been bright spots that have emerged as well for consumers. New appreciation for the, the value and kind of the heroes in healthcare, uh, as well as a lot of manifestations of creativity, right, as well. So against this backdrop of change, maybe the, the context, the question for, for today that we'll focus in on is, how do we use strategic foresight to better understand what that new normal will look like for consumers? How do we better understand potential changes in their behavior, their priorities, their habits, et cetera? So it, before COVID and not thinking about strategic foresight in general, innovation teams already had a robust tool set that, that could be applied to understand consumer behavior. Most of those tools fall within the category or, or the domain of design thinking, an established set of tools and methods to help better understand consumers. These tools include things like ethnographic interviews, focus groups, uh, and of course, data and purchasing behavior, surveys, analytics, et cetera. Um, and these tools are absolutely great and still very useful for understanding the present state and understanding current consumer behavior. But as we think about the future, as we look to try to understand which changes are going to be permanent, which ones are temporary and will return to pre-COVID levels, design thinking as a tool is somewhat inadequate for doing that future forward-looking exploration. So this is just a, you know, a quick sketch. If we think of consumer behavior over time, certainly there have been trends that people have been monitoring that have been driving change, whether that's sustainability, kind of local, locally grown movements, uh, certainly e-commerce is a big one. And then we hear, uh, you know, six months ago, hit this very large step change. The COVID era dramatically altered consumer behavior in a lot of ways. And looking forward, you know, we're here at this point and we're wondering, have the changes of the last six months in the, in the consumer context, are they permanent or are they going to revert back to normal? Well, we just don't know. One option is that, you know, the things that we're seeing now, the behaviors we're seeing now may persist. We may see an acceleration of, of current behavioral patterns uh, as a result of perhaps a second wave of COVID or, or recurring, recurring waves. We may see, you know, a, re a return to pre-pandemic trends. You know, before sustainability was a big driver for a lot of new consumer products that may return. We're not sure. Or we may encounter a, another step change in the future. So while design thinking is really good at helping us understand the present, it breaks down if we try to apply those same methods and tools to our forward-looking exploration of not only consumer behavior, but even just the world in general. So why is that? Well, if we, if we look to uh, kind of the field of psychology, we can gain some in insights. 
we know that we can't simply ask consumers or ask people about their future behavior. Uh, this is Daniel Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winner, and he popularized the field of behavioral economics, doing a lot of great work in understanding cognitive biases. And it's these cognitive biases that people carry that make us poor predictors about what we will do in the future. So we know that consume, you can't just ask consumers about what they're going to do six months from now because they're not going to, they're not going to know. And similarly, Daniel Gilbert, uh, another psychologist, has done a lot of work at looking at forecasting feelings. Turns out consumers are also very poor predictors of how they're going to feel in the future. So they don't know how they're going to feel. They don't know what they're going to do. All of that leads to uh, kind of some fundamental limitations to traditional tools for understanding consumers in that design thinking toolbox, in that design thinking uh, methodology. So all of these, these challenges, even in the best of times, consumers couldn't, couldn't look forward, but, but there's also the backdrop of massive uncertainty about how the virus will evolve, how the virus will spread, what kind of testing uh, will be available, and even what's gonna happen in the economy. All of this, I think, makes a very strong case that we need new, a new approach to our forward-looking planning, particularly when it comes to understanding consumer behavior, understanding future uh, trends. So that's where strategic foresight comes in. At this point, we're going to shift and I'm going to give you a quick introduction to strategic foresight and what it is and uh, it, about the mindset processes and tools. Okay, so what is strategic foresight? Well, most people talk about the future. They talk about it in the singular, right? The future. But we have just spent a little bit of time discussing the fact that the future is fundamentally unknowable. And actually, this point maybe a year ago, was a lot harder to, to convince people that this is the case. Many people had a, had a cognitive bias that the future was going to be like the present. If there's one thing that I can point to in terms of uh, one of the benefits of, of the pandemic is that people have come to realize even more kind of viscerally that the future is fundamentally unknowable and unpredictable. So in the, in the realm of strategic foresight, Instead, foresight practitioners talk about alternative futures, plural. Strategic foresight is a method for exploring alternate future scenarios and then use those scenarios to inform strategic planning. So just like design thinking, it's, it's a little, it can be a little bit hard to pin down and it has multi, multiple facets that are embedded in this broader kind of domain of strategic foresight. But I find it very helpful to think about strategic foresight in three categories. Just like design thinking, strategic foresight is a mindset. It's a way of approaching future planning. There's also an established and robust set of processes that organizations can follow to bring structure and discipline to this, the, the use of these, this method. And then last, because it's been around for many years, there's a robust tool set uh, that foresight practitioners use throughout this process to drive organizations from complexity to clarity. So we'll start talking about, we'll, we'll spend some time, about five minutes talking about the mindset, and then we'll move on to uh, an exploration of the foresight process. All right, so the mindset. The real purpose of foresight is not to predict the future. And this is a really important and critical anchor to keep in mind for the rest of the, the talk, as well as into the future. If there's one thing that you take away, I hope this is it. Strategic foresight is not about predicting the future. Instead, the exercise of engaging in strategic foresight helps change the mental models and eliminate some of those cognitive biases that decision makers carry in their head. And it's through this kind of cognitive debiasing that leaders are able to make better strategic decisions and better strategic plans. So another, another core element of the mindset, these alternative future scenarios that we talked about that foresight practitioners create, they are not science fiction. We don't just create them out of thin air and apply them just for fun. Instead, foresight practitioners look at the world around them 
and observe what is driving change. There are observable, measurable signals and drivers of change shaping the way the future is going to unfold. Now, some of these drivers, we can think about climate change or demographic shifts, et cetera, they're relatively certain. So we can more or less kind of explore those using one set of tools. We know they're going to occur. Other trends, whether that's the outcomes of, of an individual election, regulatory changes, or even something like the development of a coronavirus vaccine and, and the evolution of the pandemic, they're highly uncertain. And so these signals and understanding which are certain and which are uncertain uh, serves as the anchoring, the baseline for how we go about creating those alternate future scenarios. So we use those signals and drivers of change to create plausible, provocative, alternative future scenarios. And these two words here are really critical when it comes to the, the future scenarios we create. They're plausible, number one. They're rooted in observable signals and drivers of change and rooted in that analysis and that wrestling with what's certain and what's uncertain and what that means. But they also must be provocative because remember, our goal is to, to expand our notion not only of what's possible, but change the way we think about problems and the way we think about the intersection of trends and drivers and adjacencies from other industries. So all of the future scenarios that we create as foresight practitioners should be plausible, rooted in the signals and drivers, but provocative enough that people sit up and take notice and think about things differently. By and large, the last you know, element of the foresighting mindset is that innovation begins with a story about the future. If you talk with any, any founder of a startup, one of the things that they are passionate about is their vision for the future. And it's that vision of the future that drives them to create new products and services and manifest uh, those services into an improved world, into the world they're trying to create. Strategic foresight as a discipline can help organizations understand what their vision of the future is as a first step to creating it. Okay, so we've spent some time talking about the foresight mindset. Next, we're going to move on to a, a deeper analysis of the RTI Innovation Advisors foresight process. Now, the RTI foresight process is very similar to many foresight processes that you will find if you scan the literature. It has our own adaptations, our own flavor, if you will. Uh, but all foresight practitioners have a structured process that they engage with to add discipline to what can otherwise be a, a very kind of ambiguous and, and difficult process. So our foresight process has four main steps. The frame, explore, envision, and act stages. And we're gonna talk about each one of these and I'm gonna give you a few tips uh, from my experience for how to kind of engage in and succeed in each of these stages. When we're working on a foresight project, we really usually engage across two types of projects, if you will. The first is a foresight sprint. So in the foresight sprint, we take a small team, five to eight people, and we go through this entire process over the course of, of one to two weeks. Uh, and this is really important or really powerful for the teams that are looking for inputs to broader strategic planning processes or who have very critical questions that they wanna kind of explore very quickly. The other type of project we do is, is a foresight initiative, which is a little bit longer time horizon. It usually occurs over three to six months and involves a wider range of stakeholders. We still have a core team of about five to six, but there the goal is more about driving organizational change as opposed to maybe team level change, because uh, there's more, more time to engage broader parties, more time to expand the impact of that work. Recently, there's been a lot more interest in this concept of a foresight sprint as teams are trying to rapidly adapt to the, the new context. And so that we found that there are three kind of primary ways folks are interested in engaging in these sprints. And if you want to know more about any of these, please reach out. I'd be happy to share more. The first is a cross-industry foresight sprint where we bring folks together either from adjacent industries or non-competitive industries uh, to come together and explore the future. And it, we find that bringing together those diverse voices leads to new insights that if you had stayed within your silos, your organizational or industri industry silos, it wouldn't have manifest. The second type of uh, foresight sprint we engage with is a supply chain sprint. So we bring your raw material, your suppliers, your end products, 
all together to, to look across the value chain uh, at how, that, how, how to reshape that supply chain in the context of some of the, the recent challenges. And then last but not least, we definitely probably most often work with uh, teams inside companies just with members from their organization, usually across different functional groups uh, to, to enact a proprietary kind of closed doors, if you will, foresight sprint that's going to inform either innovation strategy or corporate strategy. So it's just a summary level. If you want to know more, please, please reach out and ask. I'm happy to, to share more examples. So let's dig into the process here a little bit and I'll give you a couple, a couple tips if you're thinking about trying to bring some of these principles and some of, some of the benefits of strategic foresight to, to your organization. Within the frame step, the first thing to remember is that foresighting is a team sport. We find that it's best done when you get together a diverse group of individuals to galvanize different ways of thinking and new perspectives, right? So certainly you probably could go sit at your desk and do some scanning, find some signals, create some scenarios on your own. But because you're not with a diverse group being challenged or, or seeing those new insights, you're going to miss a lot of the benefits that strategic foresight can bring uh, to challenge your own thinking. So next in the frame step, it's also really important to be intentional about the scope of the project. So I've seen teams that try to tackle something like the future of health or the future of the world. And that's just way too big to kind of wrap your mind around and really be useful as an analysis to, to the organization. On the other hand, I've seen teams, these are usually technical teams, get very specific and say, we're going to look at the future of antibacterial ointments. And that narrow scope prevents them from seeing broader macro level trends that are actually going to impact that domain uh, a little bit uh, more. So when you're setting up your framing for your foresight exercise, look for something that's in between, you know, it feels right size to the amount of time and, and, and uh, help that you have. I, I like to call that the Goldilocks theme, not too large, not too small. Okay, so once you've got your team and you've got your topic, the next step is to actually go out and explore what's going on in the world and to look broadly, ask the questions, what's driving change? And in this step, because there's so much going on, it is critical to have some kind of framework for gathering, capturing, and categorizing those types of change. I strongly recommend at the very least thinking about the steep framework so that you're looking broadly at, across societal changes, political trends, you know, economic impacts, etc. As you're engaging in this broad exploratory step, you're going to come across lots of signals and drivers of change. And many of them, you'll, you'll wonder, like, is this going to persist? Is this not? And this is where it becomes super critical to remember that foresight principle. It's not about prediction. So none of the signals that we gather in this step are necessarily predictive. Instead, we're using them to understand and categorize the types of change that could occur, which trends are likely to be certain, which trends are much more uncertain as the next sta stage of the analysis. Next, we end up in the envision step. So we, we have our, our list of trends. We understand what's driving change across our industry, or across our focal, focal theme. We then need to create alternative visions of the future that, remember, are plausible yet provocative. They have to be rooted in those signals and drivers of change that we've observed, but they should push the thinking of the, the organization or the team in new and different ways. Typically, we have a kind of a structured series of Envision workshops that we, we put teams through because moving from kind of our normal cognitively biased status quo view of the world to more creative, provocative alternative futures is really helped out by the tools and, and methods that strategic foresight practitioners use. We've already, uh, because of the COVID era, done some of these workshops in the remote setting. And I was actually pleasantly surprised with, with how well they translated uh, and how effective they were. Okay, in this envision step, it's really critical to remember that building organizational conviction requires more than a summary report at the end. 
So if your Foresight team has created these alternative futures and you put them in a, in a document, a PowerPoint document summary, and you ship it off and you're like, I had these amazing insights, this other person will too. It probably won't land in the way you think it will. I usually compare strategic foresight to riding a roller coaster. You can describe to somebody what it's like to ride a roller coaster, but it, it's just not the same as experiencing it yourself. So in this process, during the envision step, not only do you have to create the vision of the future, but you also have to find ways to immerse others in that vision. We do that through by creating either video engagements, timelines, stories of the future, artifacts from, from the future. Uh, and these points of immersive engagement, as opposed to just a report that you might read, can help bring people along in your thinking and instill that confidence and conviction in them about the changes that you're seeing uh, and, and push their thinking as well. So that brings us to the last step here, the ACT phase. One of the biggest, I guess, watch outs for strategic foresight is that without this last step, Foresight becomes nothing more than a fun activity that people engaged in. Yeah, it was great. We, we ha it was creative. I had some new insights, but I didn't really do anything with it. So being very intentional about and rigorous about how you're going to drive the insights from this exercise through to implementation, either as an input to a strategic planning process, input to you know, a, a roadmap or set of initiatives is really important. One of, the, one of the frameworks I, I like to use is, is our resilient innovation strategy framework. And in this framework, you can see the, the insights from strategic foresight are a critical input to resilient innovation strategies, but they're only one of several. You have to take those insights and marry them with insights from design thinking, your organizational mission and vision and strategy, and then think of, across multiple time horizons all as inputs to that innovation strategy that you're creating. And from there, it becomes a lot easier to do things like create roadmaps, create technology roadmaps or, or product roadmaps, or set innovation goals and, and initiatives. So as you can kind of see here on this slide a little bit, I firmly believe that design thinking and strategic foresight are wonderful complements and should be used together. This talk is about strategic foresight. I've also given webinars about the power of design thinking. I firmly believe that they, they work well, very, very well together. Your design thinking activities of understanding the present inform your understanding of those signals and drivers of change that are shaping the future. And similarly, your, your alternate provocative plausible visions of the future go back and inform the types of signals that you continue to monitor to understand how consumer behavior or other factors are evolving. So in summary, the RTI Innovation Advisors foresight process is rooted in an experience of those plausible and provocative future scenarios. And they're based on signals and drivers of change that we can see in the world around us today. And the purpose of this, of this activity, these, these projects, is to provide teams with new insights that inform and result in better decision-making for leaders and for teams. Okay, so we've, we've reached the, the last portion here where I'm gonna walk through a, a quick case study um, and share some insights and observations uh, from the present. Okay, so as I was looking across and trying to pull some signals and, and wrap those into a, a story, there's certainly you know, a lot of ways that kind of we could have thought about this and, and where we could have gone. Um, the changes that we're seeing are evident across nearly every sector. So different patterns for exercise, you can think of healthcare and the arrival of telemedicine. I mentioned already kind of this, this children learning at home and what's going to happen in schools. And certainly, it, you know, you're on a Zoom call now. Everybody's experienced the Zoom fatigue, the Zoom burnout, and questions about the future of work, right? So these consumer behaviors are existing against some very specific and, and important conversations happening across society, whether it's the, the protest movements aiming for racial equity and racial justice, 
uh, whether it's the questions about free speech and the, the role of technology companies in mediating uh, that speech. There's certainly the economy, there's the, the coronavirus itself, and there's also rising geopolitical tensions uh, between the US and China, not only uh, as it relates to the virus, but also about uh, kind of supply chains and, and trade, trade talks as well. So while, while it may seem that these, these broader societal changes are less relevant, depending on the specific problem you're facing, they actually do shape and shift the way society evolves in ways that can determine whether the bets you're placing are helping to ride a wave of change or if they're going to be facing serious headwinds. So I looked across and actually, I think it was maybe two or three days ago, uh, I learned that Amazon acquired the autonomous driving startup Zooks. And this is not the first investment that Amazon has made into the self-driving car space, but that got me thinking uh, in a particular direction. And I decided for this case study to share with you some thoughts on the future of grocery shopping. So you might say, hey, how, Jim, how did, how did your observation of Amazon acquiring autonomous driving like lead to an interest in this case study of the future of grocery? Well, hang with me, we'll get there in just a second. So we're gonna go through kind of our full foresight process really quickly, five minutes, five minutes to the future. And our framing step, we'll talk about the future, future of grocery shopping. Okay, so now let's explore. What are some signals that we are seeing in the world as it relates to the grocery shopping experience? Well, certainly amidst COVID, there were long lines at the grocery store. Folks like Instacart who provide grocery delivery are in growing rapidly and in, in high demand. Uh, other online retailers have really doubled down on their investment in e-commerce as well. Uh, some grocery stores like Kroger in some locations have actually created uh, pickup only grocery stores where they don't let consumers in. Instead, it's online ordering only. So think about that as kind of some recent changes, some recent signals. About three years ago, Amazon acquired Whole Foods. And at the time, there was lots of speculation about what does that investment mean for how Amazon is gonna interact in the grocery shopping space. We know that Amazon is really an expert in logistics, right? In logistics and delivery. And if we look kind of step back and look at some of these broader trends, increase online shopping, increase online grocery shopping and grocery delivery, uh, Amazon being an expert in that space, it made me start to think, what if Amazon decided to apply some of its uh, expertise in logistics, floor layout, et cetera, into the grocery space? Uh, they already have this, this brand called Amazon Basics, which is kind of like a generic Amazon-owned product line they may think about creating a similar line in the, in, the, in the food space. What would that look like? Certainly, of course, there's also the signal that there's the, the, the potential recession ahead. Okay, so that's just a, a curated set of signals from the last few weeks. Next, I'm gonna tell you, uh, I'm gonna try to create a picture, paint a picture of what an alternative vision of the future might look like based on these signals. So the next slide, everything on the next slide is completely fabricated. Uh, it's not true, so don't take a screen grab and think that those he these headlines are real. But so using these signals as a starting point, what if Jeff Bezos came online and said, why is milk in the back of the grocery store? That's ridiculous. It's time to rethink the grocery experience. Well, you could see a, a future scenario in which Gross, online grocery shopping continues to grow. This headline says it's now up to 40%. Uh, and Amazon creates in the future, perhaps a, a lights out grocery warehouse, grocery delivery warehouse, fully automated. You order online, it self packages and gets, gets ready for delivery. You also have you know, this against the backdrop of a recession, consumers have less disposable income, so they're looking for cheaper options. Amazon with its you know, multi-channel, multi-business model may be able to undercut uh, existing other options in the, in the grocery space. 
imagine if they created a, a brand like Amazon Basics called Amazon Staples for, for food. And then this is where we kind of get come full circle to that signal that we heard earlier. Um, the last mile delivery of such groceries, you know, imagine Amazon in the future kind of owns and perfects that last mile autonomous delivery. So all of this kind of paints a picture of Amazon becoming a dominant player in the grocery and retail space. Great, so we have this vision of the future. Now what? How is it useful? Well, remember, none of this activity, the exploration or the interpretation and visioning really matters until you move to this last step, the planning and action phase. And this is where the questions that you ask are really critical. So what might this future mean for consumer products companies that sell their items in grocery stores? What happens when the end cap, if you will, uh, where you know, consumers walk through the grocery store and see and therefore kind of buy, goes away. How much, how might that shift consumers' expectations for what it means for convenience? So also, you know, in the, in the COVID era, I'm curious about how eco-conscious consumers are, are reconciling this online ordering, the increase in online ordering, with the resulting increase in packaging waste that that ultimately creates from shipping, etc. So by and large, you know, all of these questions lead organizations not necessarily to concrete definitive answers. Foresight doesn't provide you an X equals five solution to the equation. Instead, it galvanizes critical conversations and interpretation of signals and tries to expand the understanding and the mindsets of um, decision makers and business leaders in your organization. So uh, actually also recently, I, I found this particular stat uh, from Benedict Evans, uh, a report he recently put out that I thought was really interesting because it was counterintuitive to what I thought would happen. I thought in the, in the COVID era with increased online shopping, Amazon and Google, the default would increase their market share of, of search. As it turns out during lockdown, actually the, the product search channels expanded and the number of channels and types of channels that consumers used to search for things uh, grew. And this is a really good example of strategic foresight that can inform design thinking. I have no idea why that's the case. But now with this insight, I would go to my design thinking team and say, hey, I need you to go talk to people and try to dig into this behavior, this, this apparent trend a little bit more so I can understand what are the motivations? What are the, the actions behind it? And uh, evaluate, is this likely to persist? Uh, another example of, of companies using some of this strategic visioning to actually drive change in the near term, PepsiCo recently launched two direct-to-consumer snack websites. Um, this, they launched them after, after COVID. So we have not talked, I've not talked with PepsiCo about this decision at all. So everything that I'm about to tell you comes from articles that are publicly available. I don't know that they use strategic foresight as the, the means to, to arrive at this new product, but one can see how they might have observed what's going on in the landscape ahead of COVID, realized they were going to be accelerating trends in the e-commerce and direct-to-consumer space as people stopped shopping in grocery stores and decided they needed to move and act on this. And what I found particularly interesting about this example is PepsiCo uh, stated that they went from product conception to launch of these direct-to-consumer websites in 30 days. So this is not something that strategic foresight has to inform, you know, 10 year technology futures and long term technology investments. It certainly can, but it can also help drive near term operational decisions that steer the company in a particular direction that aligns with that long term vision. Okay, so to quickly recap, we know that consumer behaviors have radically changed as a result of COVID-19. And you could actually replace consumer behavior with supply chains or internal operations or the way we worked. There's so many things that have changed as a result of, of COVID. But we also know that we need some new approaches. Traditional approaches like design thinking are valuable but insufficient as we wrestle with complexity and, and uncertainty of the future. Strategic foresight provides structured mindsets, methods, and tools for helping organizations do that long range planning. 
And when used to, together with other existing innovation tools and methods, uh, there's really a synergy and a complementarity to those approaches. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, kind of what foresight options, how, how, how we as innovation advisors can help, we have those foresight sprints that I mentioned, those two week engagements, or we can talk about a, a longer foresight initiative uh, as well. How to do, all right, so we've got about 10 minutes left and I'm gonna pop into the chat box or the, the Q&A box and take a look at the questions that have come through. If you have other questions, please don't hesitate to drop them in at this point. I'll give folks a, a minute or two to add some questions to the Q&A box and I'll scan through the comments that have been made here real quick. All right, so somebody commented uh, the, about the Walmart and their e-commerce offerings as a real strength of their uh, kind of their business model. Absolutely agree. It's definitely something that Amazon is paying attention to and you know, Walmart had to respond to the Amazon threat and really bolster that side of its business. I don't see any questions coming through in the, in the window. So I'll offer just one or two more, you know, examples, mindset shifts that I've been using to think about the impacts of COVID uh, that perhaps spark new ways of thinking. Um, before I do that, there is one question here. How many future scenarios do you recommend developing in the process? So certainly more than one, because if it's just one scenario, it's, it's a prediction. Depending on the depth of those scenarios, we usually aim for three. You know, a lot of foresight practitioners will do four because they'll take two variables, make a nice little two by two grid and use those to create four alternative future scenarios. We've used that approach, but we find that actually using three allows us to consider more than just two variables at a time. And the goal is to create things that are far enough, distinct enough and far enough apart that they push thinking in different directions. Um, I've also seen groups go as far as like 10. Those are shorter. The more you, you do, the, the harder it is to immerse in each one fully. All right, next question. What are recommended strategies to engage leadership to think past the five-year strategy framework? This seems like the limits to the, their interest in foresight. This is, a, this is a challenge that a lot of organizations face. And I will say that the folks that are quote unquote right and ready for strategic foresight really have leaders that are thinking in more than just certainly quarterly returns, quarterly shareholder returns, uh, and have kind of that visionary uh, kind of ownership as well. So if I'm thinking about trying to convince a leadership team that they need to be looking further down the pipe, um, I would probably bring not only examples of other companies that have failed to do that, but also some examples of some early signals that can, that may be impactful in the long run that could shape the strategic direction of the, of the company. It's not a, it's not an easy like formulaic pitch, if you will, you kind of have to take into account the personality and the behaviors and beliefs of the current leadership and try to tailor your message to things that they care about is my experience. All right, next question. Who should be involved in a foresight sprint? The number of people, the roles in the company, et cetera. It's a good question. Foresight sprints are best conducted with teams of I'll say six to 10. Uh, you don't want to get too large. If we get more than 10, then we actually break that into two separate sprints because you want to be able to have engaging dynamic conversations in the small group format. In terms of roles in the company, it depends on the objective of the sprint itself. So for example, if we're, if we're trying to you know, align across silos our vision for a digital transformation, then I would want to bring together certainly folks involved in digital transformation and corporate strategy, but also those business unit leads in the IT department uh, to create that shared vision and that shared action plan. Similarly, you know, if you, if you and your innovation team are thinking about trying to set the or reimagine the innovation portfolio, given the, the changes that COVID has created, you know, you can run a, a foresight sprint with just you and your your core team, if you will, uh, and that can be also very effective. All 
Uh, all right, in the chat window here, trends you see in restructuring organizations into distributed teams, the objective of driving strategy to the front lines. I will admit I haven't done a lot of research or kind of probed this very specifically. Um, I can very easily see a shift towards a more decentralized governance model, especially globally, given the restrictions to international travel. Um, some folks that I've talked to, some innovation leaders I've talked to who are in charge of manufacturing operations overseas have hired, increased their hiring locally and had to push a lot of decision making to the edges, if you will. So that's certainly, I, I have seen evidence of that in some organizations, but I haven't done enough work to, to decide whether that's an actual trend or just a, an instance from that or those few companies. Okay, so I know we're all uh, Zoom fatigued and this was a one hour webinar, but I'm gonna actually end five minutes early and give you all a chance to stretch and move around uh, before your next meeting. So if you have any questions, uh, please in the follow-up email, you'll be receiving my contact information. Feel free to reach out uh, and we can engage further around some of these, these interesting questions that have been posed. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Jim, so much, and big thanks, <clears throat> excuse me, a big thank you to RTI Innovation Advisors. When you said alternative futures, I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, we have so many of those right now. All of our futures are alternative um, right now, so really uh, interesting and, and um, important information. So thank you so much again, and as Jim mentioned, we'll be sending out a follow-up email, a link to the recording, his contact info, and I will go ahead and also save the um, chat as a document and provide that so you all can connect. Um, love that opportunity to, to network um, through the chat. So we appreciate your time today and I hope everyone has a great weekend. Thanks everyone.